Welcome to Cambridge House Live. I'm Bridget Anderson and I'm joined by Marin Katuza, who's Casey's Investment Strategist, Energy Division. Let's start off, Marin, by getting your overview of what you think is happening and what you're seeing happening in the energy sector overall. Well, I think if you look at in North America right now, a lot of people are expecting that LNG is going to be the savior, not just for the economy, but for the producers, exploration. And then you look at what's going on with the pipeline. So there's a lot of expectations already built in the markets. And I've been trying to warn investors that when everything's already baked into the price and expectations, the timelines of things actually happen are a lot longer than the market expects. So be careful, there's a lot of risk in the market. But in the international markets, I think Europe is a fantastic place to invest because the development and exploration that has happened in North America has not happened in Europe. And yet, if you take the whole EU economies, it's bigger than the, U the US. Mm -hmm. So they use a lot of oil, but yet the production is decreasing in places like the UK and other areas, which used to be net exporters, but now are net importers. So with China and India and you know Europe still needing a lot of oil, I think that the best days of investing in North America are probably behind us and you want to look for new markets with big potential. I want to go back to what you were talking about LNG and certainly about expectations because there is a lot of hope that Western Canada is going to get on board this. But have we not already missed the boat given the kind of timeline it takes to develop these products and develop the infrastructure for the products? And when you look at other jurisdictions like Australia, they are leaps and bounds ahead. Or even Russia. Mm -hmm. Russia's way ahead of Canada and the US. So yes, Canada's behind the eight ball not only because of the, uh, they haven't developed the assets that they should have 10 years ago, but more importantly, the environmentalists are going to be delaying this and the costs are going to be a lot higher. Now, you know, there's a sustainable, sensible solution to all of this, but I think what's going to happen is it will be developed, but it's going to take a lot longer and a lot more money than people expect. And it's not just the environmentalists. I mean, even on LNG or whether we're talking about oil, there's a friction between British Columbia and Alberta. And now that we've got the BC Liberal government who has been re-elected, some of that friction uh, ha still exists. I mean, not to the extent that if it was an NDP government, but certainly Premier Christy Clark has laid out some pretty, uh, very firm kind of um, expectations in place until she wants to move ahead. Well, politicians, that's their job is to squabble, right? It's political <laughs> lip service. So they're now talking about, you know, who's going to get what and on these expected profits. Mm -hmm. Now, let's just remember this. A decade ago, everybody was talking about how they're going to import LNG. So all these same experts that are talking now about how the, the U.S. is you know, going to be flooded with gas and we're going to export to everybody in the world, these same guys a decade ago were saying we need to import this. So you know, times change and you know, the IEA came out with the, you know, that America is going to become energy independent. Right. Well, I actually went and bought this report. It's an over 300 page report and I used the data that they talked about to prove that they were actually wrong. And then the irony is when you read the, the taglines in the media, it says that it's going to be sustainable. The report didn't even say that. The report said almost sustainable. Okay, that's so different from ex entirely sustainable. Exactly. So there's a lot of misconceptions in the energy market today. Uh, let's touch on briefly on the Kinder Morgan pipeline. There are some um, uh, process that, that is, is going on and um, more looking like with the political climate that this could actually move ahead. Would that be your read? I think it's going to move ahead, but it's going to happen much after the Keystone XL. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of issues. To bring those types of tankers that they need, they're going to have to do some dredging on the port. That's going to cause a lot of problems because they need the big tankers that right now the port can't sustain. So there's, I think it's going to move ahead, the permitting, but it's, it's, permitting is a very long process well, and very costly. Canada. So I think you're going to see the Keystone XL within the next 12, 24 months be approved. And then from there, we're going to focus more on the uh, Kinder Morgan. Okay, let's uh, switch gears a little bit. You've been very bullish on uranium lately. I want to talk a little bit about some of the reasons why. Sure, I, I think uranium is the world's most contrarian investment bet right today, not just in energy, but in all resources. For example, it's selling for about $40 per pound right now, mm -hmm. and no new production can come on for over $65 per pound. In Africa, just on Thursday, one of the major mines in the world that produces most of France's uranium got shut down. A terrorist attack happened on it in the Arlet Basin in Niger. So looking at even things that China is going to build twice as many nuclear reactors as America, and America today has 104 uh, running active reactors, they import over 90% of the uranium that they consume. And the ironic result of the Cold War is mm -hmm. one in every 10 homes in America are powered by Russian nuclear fuel. 
So what do investments need to do when they're looking at buying opportunities? Sure, I, I think there's great ways to buy it. You know, everyone talks about investing in, uh, you know, exploration and all that. Right now, the producers are trading at the cheapest multiples they've been in 25 years. So then there's ways to, there's actual holding companies of uranium that have no political risk, no management risk, no environmental risk, no, no exploration risk, it's there and that's trading at a discount to if they sold it today in the market. So there's many ways to buy, not mm -hmm. just the actual metal, but producers at a discount. And are there particular companies that you like uh, more than others because of the, the lack of risk? Definitely. I yeah. think right now you can buy producers that are already de-risked exploration and mm -hmm. development. You can get the production at a discount. We just had a great webinar at Casey Research website where we brought the Energy Secretary of America, the Energy Minister of Canada, mm -hmm. and the UK Authority of uh, Nuclear Energy of the UK on to talk about where's uranium going. And all three of these people who are the head of their country's energy program said, Nuclear is not just here to stay, it's growing in the rest of the world. And, but yet, I mean, I think there's still a lot of hesitancy given what happened in Japan. Without a doubt, with Fukushima, right. what happened in Fukushima, do you know it's actually more nuclear reactors are now in uh, going into production, development, mm. and proposed than in February when Fukushima happened. So even though it made everybody slow down and go rethink their programs, Japan itself said we have no option but to restart the program. That's already been declared. Now they're in the process of restarting their nuclear reactors because they're paying $17 per MCF of gas when they're trying to compete with production with Americans paying $3 per MCF. So you can't, so they know that it's coming back online. And China said, hey, we get it. We're using the fourth generation nuclear reactors and we're gonna build these all new and they're gonna build twice as many as America. What else are you watching in the energy sector then? I mean, what are you keeping a close I eye on? I think investors have to be very careful about investing in the Western Canadian sedimentary basin, hoping for dividends. Uh, because this is, we're in a market where investors are chasing yield, they're getting into companies that are paying six, seven, eight percent yield, but not understanding the risks involved. And these are not big companies. These are mm -hmm. under a billion dollar market caps that if anything goes wrong, that yield is going to be slashed. So they're chasing that 6% yield, but the risk, if anything goes wrong, that stock price can go down 50%. So I've been trying to aware, make investors aware of this for the last two years, and it's been really not a good place to invest in. We talked last in January, which was just after the U.S. election, and so things had not yet kind of settled uh, down. There was still, you know, I think, uh, I think the inauguration was happening the last time we talked. So now, you know, six months, five, six months down the road, where do you see things with the U.S. economy, and what does that mean for the energy sector? I think don't bet against the U.S. economy. You know, the U.S. dollar still the currency reserve of the world, and until that changes, where are you going to go? The euro? You know, <laughs> who owes you? You know, mm -hmm. you're going to go to Japan. So you got a lot of investors realizing that America is still the place to be. And the reality is, is they've been so successful in reducing their electricity costs through unconventional development, such as shale gas. And the reality is, is it's been a great place to invest. Is there anything specifically that investors should be aware of with this Obama administration, though? Yeah, I think you got to be expecting higher taxes. Be careful on chasing yield and be very careful of the bond market. Always good insight, Marin. Thank you very much for joining us today. My Appreciate pleasure. it.